Erling Haaland is inevitable, but at the moment Manchester City aren't, and that is raising some people to question whether or not Erling Haaland is making them worse. And this is a conundrum because Erling Haaland is the best goal scorer perhaps ever, certainly in the modern era. So on the board in front of me here, I've got a really nice graphic from John Byrne Murdoch of the Financial Times. And along the bottom here, we've got minutes played by footballers. Along the y-axis here, we've got goals scored. And as you can see, Erling Haaland is putting up the steepest line here. Now that suggests that over time, as his career progresses, he'll be putting up better goal scoring rates than Kylian Mbappe. Lionel Messi, Cristiano Ronaldo, and then even greats like Alan Shearer as well. So this is the greatest goal scorer that we've seen in modern football, and his data this season suggests that he is still on that trajectory. So I've got a non-penalty shot map here from Mark Carey. And as you can see, really, really good goal scoring opportunities. You can see that he's getting a lot of really high chances in really good areas. If we look at his actual overall data, we can see that he's scored 18 non-penalty goals. He's actually got 21 goals in total in the Premier League. Way ahead of his expected goals here. Uh, but he has always been a player who is going to be ahead of his expected goals. And then here we've got this expected goals per shot figure, an incredible 0.19. What that means is that for an average Premier League player, getting in the same sorts of locations as Erling Haaland, you'd expect them to score one in five. Now, we've already said that Erling Haaland is overperforming his expected goals. So for him, he's more likely to score even than that. So that results in him scoring a lot of goals. You can see that here, 1.16 goals per 90 minutes. He's scoring on average more than a goal a game. So if Manchester City are worse, then it's not because Erling Haaland isn't doing the things that you would expect your number nine to do. It's also worth clarifying as well that Manchester City are still a very, very good team in the Premier League. Obviously in the table so far, Arsenal are top of the table. They're eight points clear of Manchester City. But if we start looking at some of the underlying numbers, we can see that actually Manchester City are much closer to Arsenal than people might expect. So better expected goal numbers, better expected goal against numbers. And that is obviously gonna boil down in terms of the expected goal difference and the expected goal difference per 90. As we can see here, both of these teams at the moment, you'd expect them to score a goal more than their opponents given the underlying numbers, so they're both very good. But where the variance effect starts kicking in is actually when we start looking at expected points. Now, what we can do is we can take all of the underlying numbers, feed them through a smart model, which will then work out how much you would expect a team to pick up in terms of points for a game based on those underlying numbers. And when we look at that, we can see that Arsenal are actually running about eight points higher than you might expect. And so that eight point gap that we see between Arsenal and Manchester City in the table, when you start looking at expected points, disappears completely. But regardless of the fact that Arsenal and Manchester City are very similar in terms of their level this season, it's definitely the case that Manchester City are worse this season than they were last season. So let's look at the numbers here. So we've got the two seasons, last season and this season, after 18 games played. And again, you can see that the underlying numbers show that Manchester City are just much worse than they were last season. So points, they were five points ahead last season, but in terms of the expected goals, better figures last season, better expected goals against last season, and obviously then that passes down into the expected goal difference in a big way. Interestingly enough, we said that this season, Manchester City looked like they should be beating teams on average by about one goal. Last season, they should have been beating teams on average by about two goals. So that's a really big drop off. So Manchester City are definitely worse this season than they were last season. And this shows up quite nicely in the play style metrics as well. So we can see Manchester City last season versus Manchester City this season on a number of different metrics. As you can see, the overall shape of these two Radars looks very similar. Manchester City are still playing at a high level and they are still playing the way that they want to play. But there are a few interesting things to note, namely that the numbers in almost every area this season are slightly lower than where they were last season. So we can see here, they are first for shots, they were second for shots last season, but this season they've only got 17 shots per 90 minutes, whereas last season they were up at 18.8. And those shots, the expected goals per shot this season is 0.12. Last season it was 0.14, so again, a slight drop off. And then across the board then, you've just got little reductions in almost all of these figures. Manchester City, very, very similar to what they were, but they are worse, they are quite as sharp as they were. So the big question is how much of this reduction between last season and this season is to do with Erling Haaland. So on the board in front of me, I've got a typical starting 11 from the 21-22 season. This is nominally called 4-3-3 structure, but actually in possession and out of possession, it looks quite different to this. So let's just have a think about what happens in possession. So we've got Rodri here, nominally as a defensive midfielder, but in possession what we'd often see is Manchester City dropping Bernardo Silva alongside him to make a double pivot here and then pushing Kevin De Bruyne up into the front line here. And what we've 
set up here now is like a 4-2-4 structure. So control is a really important concept for Pep Guardiola. What he wants his teams to do is hold onto the ball, not give it away because the aggressive way that they play positionally is going to leave a lot of space in behind. So if you can hold onto the ball, you're stopping the opposition from being able to attack those spaces. So let's say that they force the opposition back to the edge of their box. What they're going to do is possess the ball, try and fashion dangerous goal scoring opportunities, but they also want to keep the ball in their possession as well. And to help them do that, what they're going to do is try and aggregate players around the ball. So Phil Foden here is playing as a nine, but he's not really a typical nine. He's not going to be adopting a box presence here where he's going to be a really dangerous goal scorer. Actually, what he's going to do is drop out of play, pull players with him, create spaces here that can then be attacked by, for example, Kevin De Bruyne running into this area here. But with Foden dropping out here, what that also allows Manchester City to do is to possess the ball really effectively in these wide areas. They're going to have a player advantage over the opposition and that's going to allow them to pass the ball between each other, keep the ball and then only play those passes when they need to. But another advantage of overloading on this side and retaining possession and controlling the game is that it is going to drag the opposition across defensively and generate space on the other side of the field. So we will then have this situation where Riyad Mahrez is isolated so that if the ball is played back, for example, to Joao Cancelo, and how many times did we see this happening last season, he can play a cross-field pass into the chest of Riyad Mahrez. The fullback will come across, but then you've got Mahrez with the ball. He can dribble past the fullback 1v1, hit this sort of byline area, and then play the ball across into all of these on-rushing players into the box here. But the other advantage of this structure is that it allows Manchester City to control the out of possession phase as well. So we've got Manchester City's back line here, Cancelo's pushed up into the half space, there's three defenders left here, they can move a little bit more centrally. You've got Rodri here and then in certain phases you'll have Bernardo Silva alongside him. This is a really useful defensive structure in case the ball is then turned over to be able to defend counter-attacks. So this is all about control. It's about getting the ball into this horizontal space here, playing the ball across, fashioning chances in between the lines against the opposition back line, but also having a really nice structure to defend as well. Control is the word. So what changes for Manchester City when they have Erling Haaland on the field? So we've got a typical starting 11 from this season here on the board. Again, the structure looks pretty much exactly the same, 4-3-3, but actually in possession things have changed. Before we saw that Manchester City played with a front four, like this, because they didn't have a standard striker. Now Erling Haaland is more of a traditional striker, what he is going to offer is box presence and he's a much more vertical player like this, so he's going to be operating in these sorts of spaces. But what we've done then is we've taken a player out of this area here, and that player needs to be replaced. And the way that they've done that is actually by pushing one of the central midfielders up into that line. So we've got that line of four again, but we've added a striker. So what we've essentially done is taken a player from here and moved them here. Now we've already talked about how Pep Guardiola is concerned about control, particularly in those counter-attacking moments from the opposition. He likes to have two players in this sort of area generally to make sure that that doesn't happen. And rather than then this player coming from the central midfield spot, we're seeing an inverted fullback coming in here. So again, a very similar structure. You can push your three centre-backs up here again and you've got the same 3-2 structure that we saw before. But actually there's a very different situation happening here in terms of the actual overall attacking structure. Because before we had a number of players able to aggregate over here to hold the ball, to possess it, to isolate Mares on the other side, and we've taken a player away from that area. So Manchester City can still build up roughly in the same sort of way. They can still try and get these overloads in this area, albeit with fewer players in that space because Haaland isn't going to drop in necessarily and help out. But when the ball arrives at Cancelo's feet now, he has two different options. One of those options is, of course, to find Mares isolated on the other side. But now he has another option, which is play the ball directly to probably the best goal scorer the world has ever seen. And this starts changing the dynamics of what Manchester City are trying to do. Because this pass in here is much lower risk than this pass in here. But this pass in here is to a really good goal scorer. So do you risk trying to score a goal but then losing possession and then being involved in a bit more of a transitional game? Or do you retain possession, try and do what you were doing last season and slowly break down the opposition? And this is where the problem starts appearing for Manchester City with Erling Haaland. Because Erling Haaland is a much more vertical player than he is a horizontal player. He's a player who has explosive pace, can get in behind as a really good finisher, and is also a really good box presence as well. And that is completely different to what Manchester City have been doing before. And this is something that has been noticed by pundits in the football media. For example, after the Manchester derby, the match of the day pundits looked at the fact that Erling Haaland is making certain runs that aren't really being picked up by his teammates. 
This is true, let's have a look at a few of them, but let's remember the context of Manchester City moving from one style of play to another. So here's the first one here, about seven minutes into the game. Here's Raul Cancelo moving into that half space, as we've said, and here's Erling Haaland making that run in behind one of the centre-backs. He's got the pace to actually get goal side of the other centre-back, and the pundits at Match of the Day were saying, why doesn't Joao Cancelo just play the ball here over Varane's head into this space? Haaland can attack it, it's a much more dangerous goal threat. But as we've already said, Manchester City are all about control. And this pass here is quite a risky pass. You've got to get it over the opposition player's head. You've got to get it into this space in such a way that it doesn't just go straight to the goalkeeper. And you're relying on Haaland getting to the same place as well at the same time. A very risky pass. Actually, in the event, the pass that Joao Cancelo does play is this pass over here. We've talked about isolating Mares on the far side. This is a pass that is nominally quite easy. He's got a lot of space around him. He probably is going to be able to retain possession, bring the ball down. This is the old style of Man City. This is retaining possession. This is not taking the most dangerous, risky options because you have Erling Haaland. This is about control. Here's another situation from that game. This time, Kyle Walker has the ball on the other side. Manchester City have players around the ball. They're able to possess the ball, retain possession if they want to. Erling Haaland is making this run into space behind, which has been generated by Kevin De Bruyne here, pulling Varane out of the way. And the pundits on Match of the Day were suggesting Kyle Walker should play the ball immediately over the top into that space. But again, this is another risky pass. Here's just a final screenshot. This time, Erling Haaland and Kevin De Bruyne are in opposite roles. Erling Haaland is running that channel. Kyle Walker can play the ball into that channel. He doesn't play the ball into that channel. Instead, he actually plays the ball to Kevin De Bruyne and Manchester City do get a decent chance attacking through the middle. But the point that was being made by the Match of the Day pundits is, here's all of these really good examples of vertical play where you're gonna get a huge amount of upside from Erling Haaland and Manchester City are not using them. But if Manchester City want to switch to a more vertical play style to suit Haaland, they have a bit of a problem because they don't really have the profile of players who are going to be great running in behind like Haaland is. Because at the moment, Manchester City really only have one player who's going to be able to run in behind, that is Riyad Mahrez. Riyad Mahrez is also getting a little bit old as well. But everyone else that they have potentially as a wide player, I mean, for example, Phil Foden here is much more of a central attacking player. We've got Jack Grealish here as well, but we know that Jack Grealish is more of a control player, likes to get the ball under his possession here and then cut inside, again, more centrally. Uh, they played Cole Palmer as a wide player as well, but again, he is more of a central player who is going to try and get into the box in behind a striker as well. In fact, the only player who they did have who was able to do that was Raheem Sterling, and Raheem Sterling was sold to Chelsea in the summer. There's also Alexander Zinchenko to consider as well, because if you're not going to get the width from an attacking player, then you want to get width from fullbacks. And again, Manchester City don't have the best options when it comes to fullbacks to be able to hit these sorts of wide areas and get the ball into a striker. Cancelo, as we've seen, is able to progress the ball in wide areas, but he loves to sit deeper in this half space. And then we have players like Nathan Aki, who is being played as a centre-back at the moment. We've also got Sergio Gomez, who is probably the only sort of classic fullback that they have. Uh, Rico Lewis has been great, but he is a fullback who likes to invert, likes to play in central spaces as well. And so Manchester City have a problem at the moment, and that is that they can't really play in an aggressive vertical style that will suit Haaland. Is there another solution here? Could it be the case that Manchester City could actually do what they did last season and have Haaland playing in that front line of four and then dropping Gundogan deeper into that double pivot role? Now this is a possibility, I think, but at the moment we haven't seen any indication that Erling Haaland can play like a false nine, so drop off into those wide areas and help in those build-up spaces. But this is an option as well. So is Erling Haaland making Manchester City worse? Well, it'd be hard to argue that a guy who scored 21 goals for his team is making his side worse, but he certainly made them different. And this raises a big question for Manchester City going forward. Are they gonna keep the style of play that they've adopted this season and try and bring in players to make that style of play work? Or are they gonna to return to what they did last season and make Erling Haaland fit in better? If you like this video, please consider subscribing to the channel. The Athletic is home to some of the world's best sports journalists, including journalists dedicated to each Premier League team, so every fan gets the coverage they deserve, not just the big clubs. And you can try it for free now for 30 days. See the link in the description.